Hi, I'm Professor Barry Goodell at the University of Massachusetts in the United States. I'm both a wood scientist and a microbiologist. The International Wood Culture Society has asked me to put together a short video piece on wood anatomy for viewers. Now, we all know that wood is a beautiful material and that we can craft it into sculpted works and amazing structures. But the beauty of wood really extends well beyond what we can see with the naked eye. Today, I'm gonna to show you just a little of the anatomy of both softwoods and hardwoods to whet your appetite on this topic. And we'll go from the macro scale, or what we can see with the eye, all the way down to the micro scale, and even down to the level of the nano scale at the end of the video. Even many scientists are not really familiar with what wood looks like at the micro and nano scales. And I think you will find that there are some amazing and actually stunning architectural detail that nature has wrought at those levels. And just so you know, I'm using micrographs and videos from many sources and colleagues who have contributed these. These took many hours to create, and I wanna thank all of those who contributed, and they are credited at the end of the video. Generally, we classify wood anatomical structure based on the type of tree that the wood comes from. We have softwood or coniferous trees, like the pines, spruce, and fir trees on the right side of this image. And we also have hardwoods, like oak and ash and maple. We will look at the softwoods first because they are the simplest in structure, and they are also the more primitive of the two types of woods from an evolutionary perspective. If we start with a softwood block, scanned here at a relatively low magnification using a scanning electron microscope, we can start to see some of the wood microstructure. It is important to note the different orientation of the cells. Most of you are familiar with the end grain of the wood, which we would call the cross-sectional or transverse surface. Here, the end grain is shown at the top of this piece of softwood. The side of this block of wood shows the radial wood surface, and on that radial surface, you can see a ray or a series of ray cells that are labeled with the letter R. The rays are arrayed in the tree, sort of like spokes in a bicycle wheel, going out from the center and out toward the bark. The rays function to transport nutrients from the inner bark of the tree inward to the living cells that form what we know as the sapwood. Note that the rays extend completely across a growth ring and continue on into other growth rings. Note that most of the ray tissue is composed of a type of cell that we call a parenchyma cell. Parenchyma cells function to transport nutrients along the rays, but some parenchyma cells also store those nutrients at times of the year when nutrient storage is needed. All the rest of the cells in this softwood block are known as tracheids, which are the long, thin cells that provide the strength of the wood, but that also function to conduct sap upward in the tree. The rays are connected to other cells in the wood, such as the tracheids, so that sap and nutrients can pass from one cell type to the other. As an aside, in some industries, the tracheids of softwoods are called fibers, but technically this is not correct as we reserve the name fiber for similar types of elongated cells that are actually found in hardwoods. If we go back and look at the transverse surface, of a softwood at very low magnification, we can better see the growth rings. In softwoods, 
the growth rings appear as darker and lighter bands within the wood. But this is a type of optical illusion caused just because of the different thicknesses of the tracheid cell walls at different times of the years. In temperate climates, at the beginning or spring of the year, the tree is producing new leaves and there is a need to transport water or sap from the roots up to the growing buds and expanding leaves. Relatively thin-walled tracheids are produced at this stage because the larger interior diameter of thin-walled tracheids allows more sap to be conducted in the outer portion of the tree up to the leaves. Wood cellular growth at this time of year is known as early wood production. Later in the growing season, though, less water is needed and the tree produces thicker cell-walled tracheids. These thick-walled tracheids appear to the eye as darker colored bands known as the late wood. These thicker-walled cells also provide greater strength. A single growth ring consists of a combined early wood and late wood band. Going back to our wood block, one other feature of importance to note on the cross-sectional surface is the presence of resin canals, which are composed of specialized parenchyma cells that are arranged to form a small tube. And yes, these cells produce resin, or pitch, which we find exuding from the cut surfaces of many softwood trees. The resin canal can be a useful diagnostic feature with some softwoods having very few or no resin canals and other species having relatively large and abundant resin canals. Further, some tree species will produce resin canals only when injured. We have not yet discussed the tangential surface of wood, which is this surface on the lower portion of the image of a sample of Douglas fir wood. Because the rays extend in a radial manner in the wood, we are viewing the rays here in cross-section on this surface. Some of the rays are just a single cell wide as shown here, but in some cases, the rays can be multiple cells in width. We have discussed vertical resin canals already, but note that horizontal resin canals can also be produced in some woods. You can see a horizontal resin canal here, located in the middle of a ray. When this type of resin canal is formed in some softwoods, the ray type is known as a fusiform ray. One other key feature of the tracheids is important to note. The bullseye-like features that are seen primarily on the radial surfaces of the tracheids are called the bordered pits. Here on our block of wood, the bordered pits are quite small, but can be seen extending down the length of the tracheids on the radial walls. I will show you some better images of this type of bordered pit at the end of this presentation, but these pits are the primary pathway through which water or sap moves from one tracheid to another. In the outer sapwood, the primary path for sap flow up the tree is through the pits from one tracheid to another as the sap meanders through these cells up the tree. The bordered pits can be seen somewhat better in this higher magnification radial view of a series of tracheids. If we slice through these softwood bordered pits, and view them from a tangential orientation, we can see that there is a membrane in the interior of the pit with a thickened central region that is known as the torus. Increasing magnification further and viewing using a transmission electron microscope allows us to see a single bordered pit in cross-section but the torus of the interior membrane has shifted over to one side to block one of the pit apertures that are labeled PA in this image. The shift in position has occurred 
because the interior membrane can function in some ways like a plumbing check valve. When the tree is stressed, or when wood is dried, the torus has the ability to shift from the center of the pit outward to actually block the aperture on one side of the bordered pit, as we see in this animation. This process is called bordered pit aspiration. Why is pit aspiration important? Pit aspiration will block sap flow in softwood tracheids, and this is very important if a softwood tree is injured, as an exterior wound would allow the sap to drain from the tree if aspiration did not occur. Hardwoods do not have the thickened torus region in their pits, and they use a different type of system to stop sap flow if it becomes necessary. And we will discuss this in a minute. And with that segue, now let's move on to hardwood anatomy. As noted, hardwood anatomy is more complex than softwood anatomy, and with this short introduction, we have time to only scratch the surface. The orientation of this block of hardwood, as viewed in another scanning electron microscope image, is a little different than the orientation we saw in the softwood. But note that we still have a cross-section and radial and tangential surfaces, as shown. A defining feature of hardwoods that separates them from the softwoods is the presence of vessels. Vessels are stacks of relatively large diameter hollow cells that function specifically in moving sap up the outer portion of the tree in hardwoods. Unlike softwoods, where the tracheids function both to transport sap and to provide the strength of the wood, hardwoods separate out these functions to a large extent by using different cell types. Both the diameter of the vessels and their arrangement in the hardwood growth ring will vary depending on hardwood species, and knowing the specific arrangements is useful when identifying different hardwoods. On the end grain, or cross-sectional surface of a hardwood, we often can see the cut ends of the vessels, which we more commonly just term the pores of the wood. In this image, we see pores labeled EWP for early wood pores and labeled LWP for late wood pores. If these pores are large enough, for example, in the early wood of many oak species, we can see them with the naked eye. In some hardwoods, the diameter of the vessels will change depending on the time a particular vessel is produced during the growth season. Some hardwood trees in temperate climates have larger vessel diameters in the early part or spring of the year, and the vessel diameter becomes smaller in the summer or early autumn. These species produce what is known as ring porous wood, which is the type of hardwood that we have been viewing so far. Some hardwood species, though, do not change their vessel diameter during the growth season, and these species produce what is known as diffuse porous wood. It can be more difficult sometimes to actually see growth rings in some diffuse porous species because there is a less visible delineation of each year's growth. There are also elongated cells in hardwoods that look similar to the tracheids and softwoods. This type of cell is generally known as a fiber. Fibers come in different forms, and their primary role is in the structural support of the tree. Fibers have less function in sap transport, and as noted earlier, that role is carried out primarily by the vessels in hardwoods. In addition, there are many different types of parenchyma cells in hardwoods. The rays in hardwoods are composed completely of parenchyma cells, but parenchyma cells can also be distributed throughout the wood. As an example, parenchyma cells often form patterns surrounding the vessels in some hardwood species, 
and these patterns can help in the identification of some hardwoods. Some rays in hardwoods may be only a single cell wide, but the rays in some hardwood species can also be quite wide. On a tangential surface such as this one, you can see hardwood rays that are many cells wide. These are called multiseriate rays and they are found, for example, in species such as oak, beech, and ash. These large multiseriate rays provide some of the unique figure to wood at the macro level in furniture. If the wood is cut along these rays, the appearance of finished wood products can often be quite striking. A unique feature of some hardwood trees is that they can plug their vessels when the tree is injured or stressed, and this prevents the tree from being drained of sap through the injury. In trees where this occurs, the parenchyma cells which surround the vessels will undergo a change which allows them to expand into the lumen of the vessel itself. When many parenchyma cells do this, it looks like cellular bubbles have been blown into the interior of the vessel in a process called tyloses formation. Tyloses in the vessels, labeled TY in this image, can completely block the vessels. And, as you might expect, although this is helpful in preventing sap loss from the tree, tyloses formation can also be harmful to the tree. In some types of fungal tree diseases, which trigger a tyloses formation response in vessels while the tree is alive, tyloses formation can actually be worse for the tree than the fungal attack. This short x-ray microtomography video provides us a three-dimensional view through a sample of oak and we get a good look at tyloses in the vessels as we digitally fly through the wood. Tyloses are very important in some types of wood products and, for example, the oak wood for aging wine and whiskey must be selected carefully as oak species without tyloses, such as this sample we viewed earlier, would allow all the liquid inside a cask to leak out through the open vessels. There are many more aspects of softwood and hardwood anatomy that we could discuss, but this hopefully serves as a short introduction to further spur your interest in wood microstructure. I thought I would leave you with some images of the bordered pits of white pine, a softwood species taken at very high magnification. The images were taken using a relatively new technique called STED microscopy, which allows imaging of living tissue at resolutions that were not possible previously. And it has allowed us to see some of the features of the bordered pit membrane that had not previously been understood. We start by zooming in on several bordered pits in the radial wall of a white pine tracheid. I think from viewing some of these clips, it will help you to understand how amazing the nanostructure of wood actually is, perhaps even rivaling the beauty of objects that we can craft from wood. The red colored material in these clips is a compound called pectin, which is a sticky, flexible substance, and the bulk of the torus surface in the bordered pit membrane is composed of pectin. All the green colored material is cellulose, which is a substance that forms the backbone of wood structure. In these clips, we are viewing bordered pits in both the aspirated and unaspirated form. One of the things that viewing the samples at this high level of magnification allows us to see is how the pectin is able to shift position during the aspiration process to become redistributed as the pit undergoes aspiration. In some of the earlier images, we could see how the pectin actually molded to the bordered pit aperture or opening during the aspiration process, allowing that pit to be fully sealed to prevent sap flow. A never before feature 
that we were also able to see by imaging cellulose only was a small pocket or hole in the interior of the torus of the bordered pit, which in the living tree contains fluid. The fluid appears to help maintain the structure of the pit membrane until a point in time when pit aspiration may occur. And with that, I hope you've enjoyed this short presentation. My contact information follows in this video, and I'm happy to be contacted by anyone about any of the information that I've presented today or on any aspect of wood, wood deterioration, wood anatomy, and similar topics. If you have questions on any of these, please feel free to contact me. Thank you, and thank you for your attention.